This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I started doing aging research a few years ago uh, when I got interested in aging and, aging and cognitive decline. I have no idea how I could have gotten interested uh, in that topic. <laughs> what I got interested in was, and I hadn't done any work on aging at all, as I got interested in cognitive declines that occur during normal, healthy aging rather than declines associated with neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and the reason for that is we have a larger and larger population that is getting older and older and is staying healthy. And we need to understand the causes of cognitive declines in these, this large population of aging folks that are healthy, that are out there riding bikes and so on. And when I started looking at this literature, I was impressed by the fact that these declines are often sudden rather than gradual, and that they're often preceded by an infection like the flu or an injury like hip surgery. And in fact, um, these declines are so prevalent in aging individuals that there's a term for it called postoperative cognitive dysfunction. Now, so this is what I wanted to explore and find the causes of and then treatments for. Um, it was called self-help. <laughs> um, now, <clears throat> none of this will make sense unless I des describe to you that this work flowed very naturally out of work we were already doing on communication pathways between the immune system and the brain. Now, it's been known for a long time that the peripheral immune system signals and talks to the brain. Now, you already know this on logical grounds because during periods of illness, infection, and injury, there are mood and behavioral changes and mood and behavior is regulated by the brain. Therefore, the brain has to know. When you had the flu the last time, you felt sick. Well, feeling is done by the brain. So the brain has to know. And on more scientific grounds, it turns out that our lab and many other labs have shown that the electrical and chemical activity of the brain changes quite radically during peripheral infection or peripheral immune challenges. So immediately, there are several issues. Which products of immune activation are key in talking to the brain? And how do they talk to the brain? It turns out that the key molecules in the periphery that initiate the cascade of events that talk to the brain are pro-inflammatory cytokines, particularly interleukin-1, that are released by activated innate immune cells when they recognize a foreign substance. Here's a macrophage about to recognize a bacteria. These macrophages will then make a variety of substances, including interleukin-1, and that's really the key in starting the signaling to the brain. How do we know this? Because if we block IL-1 receptors in the periphery, or if we block the synthesis of IL-1 in the periphery, the brain now doesn't know that you're sick. Or if we simply administer one of these cytokines peripherally, your brain acts as if you're sick, even though you're not. Well, OK, how do these peripherally released pro-inflammatory cytokines signal the brain? The obvious idea would be that they accumulate in the bloodstream when you're sick, and then they cross into the brain and do their thing. The only problem is these are large proteins and so cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. 
And so a variety of mechanisms have been found that allow bloodborne cytokines to signal the brain. To save time, I won't run you through those. But there were a lot of aspects of immune to brain signaling, which I won't bore you with, that these peripheral communication routes could not explain. And so in our lab, we started thinking about it, about it. And I say to my cohort, Linda, and she says things to me, and we talk back and forth. And I said to her, you know, the immune system is really a sense organ, in addition to its other functions. It's a diffuse sense organ scattered throughout the body, and one of its jobs is to tell the brain about events in the body relating to infection and injury. And then she said, well, Steve, how do sense organs communicate to the brain? And I said, well, over peripheral nerves. So your eye communicates to the brain over the optic nerve, et cetera. And so then we asked ourselves, is there a peripheral nerve that innervates places where immune responses happen, like lymph nodes, spleen, that sends afferent signals to the brain? The answer was, well, yeah, there is, the vagus nerve. So most vagal fibers are actually efferent, conveying, sorry, afferent, conveying signals to the brain. And make a long story short, this is 10 years of research in one slide, um, we found that these peripherally released cytokines in places like lymph nodes actually activate afferent vagal terminals that then send signals to the brain. We found that there are IL-1 receptors on structures that innervate vagal terminals. We found that infection in IL-1 itself activate these vagal fibers. So the vagus carries a neural signal to the brain telling your brain that you're sick or that you have an injury. So we then asked, well, what happens within the brain when the I am sick message gets to the brain? And a lot of interesting things happened, but one of the most interesting thing was that the brain then made its own interleukin-1 beta in response to that peripheral signal. So what you're looking at here are IL-1 protein levels in the hippocampus six hours after lipopolysaccharide, which is simply a constituent of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. So if you sort of want to mimic a bacterial illness in a rat, just inject it with lipopolysaccharide. Macrophages recognize it, act like it's bacteria because it's a constituent of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. And look what happens in the hippocampus in response to different doses of lipopolysaccharide injected in the gut. Now, it's important to understand the lipopolysaccharide does not get into the brain. So this is IL-1 that's being made in the brain in response to signals that are in the periphery. Massive amounts of IL-1 are made in the hippocampus. And I need to tell you this is IL-1 synthesized in the brain. It's not IL-1 that's crossing into the brain. And there's regional selectivity. It's not everywhere in the brain. And the hippocampus is one of a number of hotspots. Who in the hippocampus is making IL-1? Well, it turns out to be glial cells, not neurons, and especially microglial cells. So here you've got IL-1 staining. Here you've got microglial staining. A and B are control sections. And then the others are after peripheral illness. And what you will see is IL-1 being made in microglial cells. And this is some of our staining. You can see how activated microglia in the hippocampus become when you have a peripheral illness. Now, this is especially interesting because microglia have been called the, immune, the, the resident immune cells of the brain. They're immunocompetent cells. They're myeloid in origin. And what microglia, which are quiescent and supposedly at rest do, is they send their processes out many times a second. And what these microglial processes are doing are surveilling for danger. They're looking for danger. Here's what they do when they find danger. This is going to be a toxin injected right there. This is real time, by the way. So those are your microglial cells. So this is a unique arrangement 
What I'm saying is a molecule released by peripheral immune cell induces the de novo synthesis of the very same molecule by immune cells within the brain. Alternatively, what I'm saying is peripheral IL-1 induces brain IL-1. But even more generally, since IL-1 is critical to the inflammatory cascade, what this says is peripheral inflammation begets neuroinflammation without inflammatory molecules actually entering the brain. And this is critical to understand to the rest of what's to follow. So this got me wondering, what does IL-1 and other cytokines in the brain actually do? Well, you would think they're adaptive, and we did find some adaptive functions, some things IL-1 in the brain is very important for that are adaptive, that are good. But we also noticed that a number of human conditions in which there are elevated levels of circulating peripheral cytokines, so cancer chemotherapy, lupus, autoimmune disease, all things where you have very high levels of circulating cytokines in the periphery are associated with cognitive disturbances of various kinds. Now, what have I just told you? I've told you that peripheral cytokines induce brain cytokines. So you would suspect that brain levels are elevated in these human conditions, although you can't measure IL-1 in human brain. There's no imaging way to do this. And the fact that IL-1 increases are especially robust in the hippocampus is also just suggestive, since the hippocampus is critical in cognitive function. So we wondered whether it's this IL-1 in the brain that is by assumption induced in these human conditions could actually be involved in producing the cognitive impairments. So the first question was, well, will putting IL-1 into the brain produce cognitive deficits, and will these deficits be specific to functions for which the hippocampus is critical? So the kind of paradigm we use for this is very simple. We use several, but this is the easiest to explain, so this is the one I'll concentrate on. We do others, obviously. So what we do to look at this is what we do is we do your classic fear conditioning experiments. You take a rat, stick it in a box, a tone comes on, a foot shock occurs at the end of the tone. You then later test for memory of fear of the context, say several days later, by putting the rat back in the context and looking to see if it freezes, which is the rat's dominant response to being afraid. Or you test for fear of the tone by putting the rat in a change context, turning on the tone and seeing if it freezes. Now the reason this is a good task is because the hippocampus is especially important in developing representations of contexts, putting together the elements of a context that make the context. And the hippocampus is particularly important for memory, forming long-term memories for contexts. But the hippocampus is not involved. So if you were to make a hippocampal lesion, what you would see is very little memory for fear of the context. But the hippocampus is not involved in memory of fear to the specific stimulus, the tone, because that's not a context. The hippocampus is involved in building contexts. So after a hippocampal lesion, memory for the tone fear would be perfect. And so you can dissociate hippocampal and non-hippocampal forms of memory. You can do it with other tasks as well. So we did the obvious experiment. We gave fear conditioning just like I described to you. But then after the fear conditioning was over, we put a little bit of interleukin-1 into the brain, one nanogram. Now we gave the interleukin-1 after the learning experience because we wanted to make sure that you couldn't explain any effect of IL-1 as interfering with the learning of the task, as opposed to forming a memory. So we waited till the task was all over before we put the IL-1 into the brain. And then a couple of days later, we tested for memory of the context. And the interleukin-1 produced a massive interference with memory for the context. But it did not interfere with memory for the tone at all, which means the animals were perfectly capable of freezing. They're perfectly capable of learning. They just did not remember the hippocampal form of the task. Now, we did a few other things. We injected, and I'm just not going to show you data to save time. We micro-injected the IL-1 in the hippocampus. We produced the same effect. And then you probably all know there's a two or three hour window over which a memory is consolidated after learning. And so we delayed the IL-1 injection. And we could delay the IL-1 injection about two hours after learning and still interfere with the formation of that context fear memory. 
So it is an effect on memory, not an effect on learning. And we showed we could block the whole thing by blocking the IL-1 receptor with the IL-1 receptor antagonist. So it was specific to activation of the IL-1 receptor. So the next step should be simple. This is all leading up to aging, right? I'm giving you the background you need. So all should be simple, right? Examine the hippocampi of aged animals, and you'd expect IL-1 and other inflammatory molecules to be elevated. I could find that, I could publish it, and I could go on to something else, and we're done. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. The literature on whether cytokines are elevated in the aged brain is extremely inconsistent. We looked at it, we did not see elevated cytokines. Boo hiss. <laughs> but we did see signs of microglial activation. So this is looking at MHC2 relative gene expression. MHC2 is a marker of microglial activation. This is in the hippocampus. And if you look at 24-month-old rats, which are old, and three-month-old rats, which are young, there are signs with a that aging does induce phenotypic signs of activation, but these cells are not producing cytokines. At this point, I was sitting listening to a talk by a fellow named Hugh Perry, and I don't know if I should tell you this story. I didn't want to hear this talk. I got dragged to it. Uh, I was really pissy, and I didn't want to be there. My spouse, Linda, dragged me to this talk, and I didn't want to be there. And she said, no, no, it's going to be a good talk. And I said, it's about prion disease. I don't care about prion disease. I don't want to hear about prion disease. She said, OK, let's compromise. We're going to the talk. <laughs> I said, all right, all right, all right. And what Perry pointed out, it was a good thing I went to this talk. What Perry pointed out is although we tend to think of glia as being either active or inactive, that there are actually a variety of glial activational states, with one of them being a state that you could call sensitized or primed. So when microglia are in this state, they show phenotypic signs of activation, but they're not inflammatory. But if they're stimulated, they overproduce cytokines. So they're sensitized or primed. And I almost literally jumped up in the air. Maybe not almost. <laughs> and I did something like went, bingo, got it. I said, maybe normal healthy aging primes glial cells. So that they're not basally inflammatory, but they over respond to challenge. <clears throat> well, what do we already know sends signals to the brain that stimulate glia? Well, peripheral inflammatory events. And remember where I started all this with postoperative cognitive dysfunction and all these peripheral inflammatory events. So I said, aha, maybe aging is a risk factor that sensitizes the organism to inflammatory challenges because it primes glia. Simple hypothesis. So first question was, does aging really lead to an exaggerated brain IL-1 response to peripheral inflammation? And is any such effect general across the brain, or is it all selective to the hippocampus? So the, so the paradigm we developed is we would take animals, young animals, and old animals. Now, what I have to tell you is since I was interested in normal, healthy aging, I did not want senescent animals, because that's a whole other story. And these Fisher Brown Norway crosses are quite healthy. And a 24-month-old Fisher Brown Norway cross is aging, but not aged. It's not senescent. You know, they don't have any tumors. They're still pretty healthy rats. And so we would develop a paradigm where we would infect them with E. coli. And then at various times later, two hours to 14 days later, we would look at IL-1 in the hippocampus. Is it clear what we're going to do? And other brain regions. So this is a busy slide. What you have is hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, hypothalamus, parietal cortex, old animals and young animals, right? Everything is scaled to 100%. So 100% means the E. coli is not doing anything, OK? So let's look at the hippocampus. And let's look at young animals. Well, two hours after E. coli, you've got about a doubling of IL-1 levels. So big IL-1 increase in the hippocampus, but by 24 hours, it's back to baseline. And we filled in these time points later, in about 10 hours, 8 to 10 hours after E. coli, IL-1 in the hippocampus in a young animal comes down to baseline. But look at the old animals. It's up at 8 days. 
So eight days versus eight hours. And nothing very interesting is going on in any other brain region. I mean, there, there, there's some increases produced by E. coli, but there's no aging effects, nothing interesting. So this is pretty selective to the hippocampus. Well, there's some immediate issues you might think about. Maybe the prolonged response in the brain occurs not because glia are primed, which is our idea, right? But maybe it's the peripheral response to E. coli that's prolonged in the old subjects so that the brain is merely signaled for a more prolonged period of time, right? So maybe, maybe the, the priming isn't in the brain, it's in the periphery. And so they're just getting a bigger peripheral signal. Um, so we've actually looked at the inflammatory response to E. coli in the periphery in the old and the young animals. Or maybe they just, the old animals clear the bacteria more slowly. Um, and we've looked at all that. And I don't know how much of the data really to show you. Um, but here's, here's for example, um, IL-1 in blood in the old and the young animals in response to E. coli. No difference. <laughs> so maybe it's not in the blood. Maybe it's in the spleen. No old, young difference. We've looked at bacterial clearance. I won't even show you that. No old, young difference. Um, we can't find any, in this, in this level of aging, you can use older animals where it will be exaggerated in the periphery, but not in these animals. The priming is in the brain, not in the periphery. The other option is maybe E. coli enters the brain in the aging subjects. The blood-brain barrier is compromised by age. So maybe the E. coli are getting into the brain. We've looked at this in two ways. We've cultured E. coli from hippocampal homogenates. No, no, no E. coli in the brain. But that's not very sensitive. So we looked at the 23S region of ribosomal RNA in the brain with quantitative PCR. This is present in bacteria, but not mammalian brain. So if you see it, you know it's got to be the E. coli. And we can't see it. And if you can't see it with PCR, it ain't there with the amplification that's involved in PCR. So the E. coli is not getting in the brain. So the hippocampus makes IL-1 for a prolonged period of time after peripheral infection in aging animals. And this is not because there's either an exaggerated signal to the brain or because E. coli is getting into the brain. But it does, does it have to be glial? Well, it doesn't have to be glial. Who knows who's making the IL-1 in the brain, right? Now, that's actually not an easy question to answer in vivo. So a postdoc in my lab, Matt Frank, developed a protocol where we could rapidly isolate microglia from hippocampus or any other brain structure, uh, put them in a dish, and look and study them. And this is an ex vivo procedure. So we can do whatever we're going to do to the animal, give it E. coli, whatnot, wait however long we want, then take the microglia and look at them aging, et cetera. These are very pure microglial cultures. They're over 99% microglia. This thing has all kinds of nice features that I won't bore you with. OK. So here's what happens when you look at microglia from three-month-old subjects and 24-month-old subjects put in culture. And this is IL-6 relative gene expression. This is IL-1 beta relative gene expression. But I could have picked a lot of other genes. I just don't want to. I hate these graphs that show. 50 different cytokines and all the rest of it, so I just picked a couple. When you don't stimulate them, they're not making IL-1 or IL-6. They're not inflammatory. But look what happens when you start putting LPS into the dish, along with the microglia. The microglia from the old animals now overexpress cytokines. That is, they are primed. This is the definition of priming or sensitization. These microglia are sensitized by age and by many other things which we could talk about, but it's not the topic of this talk. All right. So in the aging animal, there's this increase in IL-1 in the hippocampus that lasts 8 to 14 days. So then the question is, well, is there a cognitive impairment that has a similar time course or not, right? Now, to look at this, we had to do a different paradigm. We had to give E. coli or a vehicle, and then four days, eight days, or 14 days later, do the fear conditioning, and we've obviously done it with other tasks as well, and then test memory. The problem is, since we're now giving E. coli before the learning experience, we have to make sure that it's not interfering with the learning of the task. 
that it's actually interfering with memory consolidation. And so in addition to doing a long-term memory test, we did a short-term memory test to make sure they actually learned it. Are we okay? There's a lot of data here and there's a lot of ways to look at it, so let's do this. So this is memory for the context, the part that requires the hippocampus. Four days, when the learning was done four days after E. coli or vehicle. And you can see in the young animals, E. coli doesn't interfere with anything, but in the old animals, there's an impairment if there's four days in between the E. coli and test. Be okay? Um, this is memory for the tone, which doesn't depend on the hippocampus, and it's perfect. That is to say, E. coli four days before learning doesn't interfere with your forming memory for tone fear, the part that doesn't require the hippocampus. It doesn't matter which group is which, they're all the same. Here's memory for context in the old animals. We don't need young animals anymore because they're not impaired at four days, so, who cares? so why test them at eight days? The old animals are still impaired if there's eight days between the E. coli and the learning, but they're not impaired if there's 14 days. So this perfectly mirrors the time course of the IL-1 increase in the hippocampus that I showed you earlier, right? And here's the short-term memory test. At, no, this is tone. T tone is never, tone fear is never affected. It's only the hippocampal for, form. And here's short-term memory versus long-term memory at four days. Short-term memory is perfect. E. coli does not interfere with their learning the task. They remember it fine for an hour or two, but they can't form a long-term memory, the old guys. So a few questions you might ask, and again, I'm not going to show you data. This is another time saver. A few questions you immediately may ask, well, we started by talking about surgery. So what happens if you do surgery instead of doing E. coli? And we do this thing called the laparotomy, which I'm not going to bore you with the details, but it's just doing sur surgery. You know, you open them up, you palpate the organs, you sew them up, just like a human would have. And it reproduces every aspect of what I've showed you with E. coli, and with the same time course. And it's not the, anesthe it's not the anesthesia. We have anesthesia controls. It's the actual surgery. <coughs> You might ask, well, that's all fine for fear conditioning. How about other hippocampal memory tasks? We've done them. You get the same effects. Mars water maze, I'm not going to bore you with it. And our effects lasted from somewhere between 8 and 14 days, right? You might say, well, is there anything that would make it last really much longer? And the answer is yes. It's multiple hits. The hits summate. So you recall that each of our hits, the laparotomy and the E. coli, produce effects that last for 8 to 14 days. <laughs> But if you give surgery and four, day, four or five days later give a bacterial infection, now the deficits are relatively permanent. All right, now before, before going on to mechanism, which is the next question, we wanted to say, can we demonstrate this phenomenon in synaptic plasticity as opposed to behavior and memory, i.e., can you see it in a hippocampal slice with long-term potentiation, in this case in the uh, Schaefer collateral CA1 pathway. So, you, so most of you probably know there's this, this phenomenon called long-term potentiation, where if you give high-frequency stimulation to the presynaptic neuron, that that increases the efficacy of the synapse between that presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, so that when you later stimulate that presynaptic cell, you get an exaggerated postsynaptic response. Did I say that clearly? I think so. And that's called long-term potentiation. So here's just an example of long-term potentiation. <laughs> this is actually in our lab. So here, that those presynaptic Schaefer collateral cells are given four trains of one second, 100 hertz stimulation here in this group. And you can see that that potentiates then for about 150 minutes the postsynaptic response to stimulation as measured by the EPSP slope. Okay, did, did I say that in a way that made it any sense? Sure. All right, the first thing we had to do, I won't even run you through this, is make sure basic synaptic plasticity is fine in these animals. Because if basic synaptic function isn't right, then the long-term potentiation is sort of uninterpretable. And here's just a couple of you know, input-output functions, paired facilitation, everything is normal 
in these animals, the old animals who are infected, without bothering you with it. So then we looked at this late long-term potentiation and boo hiss, another boo hiss phenomenon. If you look at the LTP, the two old animal groups are actually in the middle, aged and aged infected, nothing, zip. <sighs> boo hiss. But there's always got to be a but, right? Because if there was no but, I wouldn't be showing you the slide. <laughs> But we said, you know, this four, one second, 100 hertz trains, very unnatural. And so what a lot of people use is theta bursts to do long-term potentiation, which is said to be more physiological. So theta bursts are 12 bursts of four pulses at 100 hertz. This is supposed to be more natural. And now look, the aged animals that had gotten E. coli four days, these are hippocampal slices now, the aged animals that had gotten E. coli four days earlier show very little long-term potentiation. And it's arguable whether they show any late long-term potentiation at all. So there's a massive interference with the development of LTP after theta burst stimulation in these old animals when they had E. coli. So provisional summary, aging sensitizes microglia. There's a prolonged increase in hippocampal IL-1 following infection or injury, and hippocampal dependent memory and LTP is undermined for a long period of time. But none of this says IL-1 is causal. So many of you probably know that the IL-1 system has an endogenous IL-1 receptor antagonist called IL-1RA. So it's an endogenous receptor antagonist. Um, it's been obviously cloned. And you can get human recombinant IL-1RA. And making a long story short, if you microinject IL-1 receptor antagonist into the brain at the same time that you inject E. coli four days earlier, so here you have this massive interference with LTP, and it's completely blocked if you block the IL-1 receptor antagonist at the time of the E. coli administration. Okay? And here's the similar exp experiment with behavior. If you inject the IL-1 receptor antagonist into the brain at the time of the E. coli, you now do not get an impairment with long-term memory formation. So blocking the IL-1 receptor makes it all better. So how does IL-1 interfere with the formation of hippocampal long-term memories? Well, it might directly interfere with the neural processes that are involved in plasticity, like it might affect some ion channel, and it actually does, but I'm not going to go there today. Um, but IL-1 might also alter another product further downstream, and that it's this downstream product that's critical. And we've been especially interested in the second possibility, that what the interleukin-1 and the old guys are doing when they go up is interfering with downstream products. And the two downstream products that we're very interested in is the neurotrophin brain-derived neurotrophic factor and the immediate early gene arc. And I'll talk about each of them briefly. We were very interested in BDNF because it's known to play a crucial role in long-term plasticity and the formation of long-term memory, but plays only a minor role in short-term memory and short-term plasticity, which is exactly what we found the E. coli to do in the old animals. And it's also known that BDNF is critical for theta burst LTP, but not for the four-train form, which is, again, exactly what we found. The most interesting part of what we've done, I think, involves the processing of BDNF. Now, BDNF is actually transcribed as a pro-hormone, pro-BDNF. Um, and the pro-BDNF actually has to be cleaved to form mature BDNF. And it's only the mature BDNF that binds to the tyrosine kinase B receptor. And it's that receptor that facilitates LTP and memory and all the rest of it. Pro-BDNF actually binds to this other receptor that very likely facilitates long-term depression as opposed to long-term potentiation. And so it's the mature BDNF and it's track B activation that's so important for memory and plasticity. And it's mature BDNF and synaptic elements of the cell that's critical. And so what we have done is to make synaptoneurosomes that are enriched for the synaptic elements. And, um, this just kind of shows you how enriched uh, this P2 fraction is 
in, in synaptic and synaptic elements. This postsynaptic density number five is a, is, a, is, a, is a synaptic element, synaptic protein. And you can see how enriched it is um, in this P2 fraction. So what we do is we do our experiments with these old guys. We give them E. coli, we wait, whatever. We look at the hippocampus. And then we make synaptic neurosomal preparations and then we look at various aspects of BDNF in those synaptic neurosomes. Is that clear? Sort of. All right, and these are, this is what you see. So what you're looking at on top here is the pro-BDNF, that, that the, the form that's transcribed, it's pro-BDNF. And you see not much. Doesn't matter if you're young or old, doesn't matter if you're infected or not, there's really no change. But look at the mature form of BDNF. The mature form of BDNF, it's fine if you're old, but look what the E. coli does in the old animals. These animals are not processing. These old animals who are infected are not processing the pro form into the mature form. Now, we also looked at um, the receptor, the track B receptor, and it's not changed by aging or infection. Um, at all, e either receptor. So it's actually the processing of the BDNF protein that's interfered with by infection in the aged animals. It's not the receptor. Then you can always say, well, but does this really, is the reduction in mature BDNF enough to affect actual track B signaling? And that's a complicated a diagram to tell you that track B signaling involves the phosphorylation of the track B receptor the formation of phospholipase C1 gamma and some MAP kinase things. So don't worry about it. All it means is that's what we're going to look at. And so here uh, on top is the phosphorylated track B receptor. And look, again, aging doesn't do anything, but the aged animals that have had E. coli, there's reduced phosphorylated track B, there's and there's reduced, and the downstream products from that receptor, ERK and phospholipase C, are all reduced not by aging, but by the interaction of aging and infection. So the signaling events are actually, are actually reduced. I'm going to save a little time by just telling you that this shows you that uh, if you block the interleukin-1 receptor, you block these BDNF changes. So it is the interleukin-1 that is producing these BDNF changes downstream. And so, so you know what's going on with BDNF. So um, this complicated thing here is only meant to convey to you um, that it's BDNF and the activation of track B that's critical for the transcription of ARC. And ARC plays a critical role in synaptic plasticity. And let me try to give you an intuition as to why. When you have a synaptic event, here's your presynaptic neuron, here's your dendritic spine, in order for there to be long-term plasticity, you need to form new proteins here, right? But proteins are generally made not out in the dendrite, obviously, right? And so how do you get a new protein that goes only to the dendrite where there was activation. Because that's not where proteins are made. They're made out here, right? So how do they go to only this spine and not other spines? The answer is, or an answer is, that there are some RNAs, some RNAs that are actually transported out to the dendrites so that they can actually make the protein right out there in the dendrites. And ARC is the classic example of such an mRNA. And that's why it's thought to be so critical to inducing plasticity. This is called the problem of synaptic tagging and capture. So how do you only get a protein made in the spine that's activated out of the thousands of spines when that's not where proteins are made? Right? You, you all know where. Well, it's because this mRNA actually and other mRNAs actually are transported out to the spines. That's why this is so critical. All right. This is a busy slide. So what you're looking at is ARC gene expression. So here's the way the experiment goes. You get, you're old, you're old or young, you get E. coli or vehicle, four days later you get fear conditioning or home cane treatment. 
and then 30 minutes later, we look at ARC. This is unfortunately not the best way to look at ARC. Um, and we're doing the best way in collaboration with Carol Barnes, but that's a whole other story. So this is just looking at just doing PCR. Now let's look at the three-month-old animals. If they get conditioning, it induces ARC like crazy. So the learning experience does induce ARC like it should, and the ARC is not reduced if you've had infection. Now look at the old animals. ARC is induced, but if you had an infection four days earlier, much less induction of ARC. And we know it's, beca it's because of the BDNF reduction. So there's, we know that there's this cascade from IL-1 to BDNF reduction to ARC reduction. And you can block this all with IL-1-RA. So we know IL-1 is upstream of this. And we are continuing to march down this mechanistic pathway. Yet the IL-1 already blocked it. You don't need to see it. Um, now we're continuing to march down this mechanistic pathway, but I'm going to stop talking about mechanism. You can ask me questions afterwards in more detail, because we're doing a, it's obviously we're marking down, marching down this molecular pathway looking at mechanisms. But I want to turn in the little time I have left to what we've done to figure out how to block all this, how to prevent it all. And we've pursued a variety of strategies. <clears throat> Um, but the most complete data set we have so far is on voluntary exercise, which is why I'm going to present that data to you. And the reason we looked at voluntary exercise is because exercise is well known to increase BDNF in the hippocampus. That's not my work, there's lots of people's work. Now, our animals had always been 24 months old. And so we started doing experiments where just arbitrarily, we gave these animals a running wheel at 22 and a half months. So we're going to give them six weeks of voluntary exercise if they feel like running. They don't have to run. We just attach a, a running wheel to their cages at 22 and a half months of age, and they can run or not run as they choose. Now, one of the things, <laughs> when we started this, people said these old animals aren't going to run. <laughs> and, it's, and it's partly true. They run, but they run very little. I mean really very little. This is meters run per week. Now a young animal will run five kilometers a night, often, voluntarily. And these guys are running 1,000 meters a week. And the young animals are running five kilometers a night. So they run, but not much. Now they do run enough to lose weight. So. I don't have the group designations on here, but the top group is controls. This middle group is, this is percent, this is change in body weight. This middle group is given um, a locked running wheel. So they have a wheel, but they can't, the wheel won't turn. So they can go in it, they can climb in it, but it's not going to turn. And then here's the group um, where the wheel can turn. And they actually lose weight, despite the fact that they're running really a small amount. The obvious question then, is what happens when we give them at the end of this E. coli and then test their memory, right? It's a profound effect. So here's your sedentary animals. They don't have a wheel. You give them E. coli or vehicle. Four days later, you give them conditioning. You test their long-term memory. The E. coli produces a profound impairment in the sedentary animals, produces a profound impairment in the animals with locked wheels, produces no impairment in the runners, none, even though they ran very little, but they did run. You can ask, did the running revert, did the animal prevent, remember we started them running at 22 and a half months and we normally test animals at 24, so you can say did the running prevent the development of this or did it reverse it once it was there, right? And to do that you have to know whether they would be impaired at 22 and a half months, right? If they are, then it's reversing it. So we did that. We, they are impaired at 22 and a half months. They start being impaired at about 18 months once they're infected. So having a running wheel for six weeks actually reversed the impairment that was there. You can say, well, what did it do to microglial sensitization? What did it do to IL-1? What did it do to BDNF? So here are microglia isolated from the hippocampus of 
the guys with the locked wheel and the runners, TNF alpha gene expression, IL-1 beta gene expression, IL-6 relative gene expression, and increasing doses of LPS. Having that wheel for six weeks reversed the microglial sensitization. And it reversed the increased levels of brain IL-1. So here, what you're getting are, are, are animals that get E. coli or vehicle. We look in the hippocampus four days later. In the sedentary animals, you still see the I elevated levels of IL-1. But in the runners, there are no elevated levels of IL-1 in the hippocampus, just as there aren't in young animals. So with BDNF, we did something a little different. So it's known that when you learn something, it induces BDNF in the hippocampus. And that BDNF induction in the hippocampus is critical to your forming a memory. So this is just young animal data. So this is looking at BDNF mRNA in CA1 of the hippocampus, but you see this in other regions, either at baseline or at various times after fear conditioning. Now, if you look in the black bar, this is just regular animals, you can see that getting learning, getting the fear conditioning task, induces tremendous levels of BDNF. Okay, we okay with that? You can see if you learn something, the BDNF goes up, and that is critical to memory formation. What you see in the white bars is what they do if you put L IL-1 into the hippocampus. Now there is no BDNF increase. That is, the IL-1 does prevent the learning task from inducing BDNF. So now we're going to do this in sedentary locked wheel and runner wheels. Let's just go through one brain area. Let's just go through CA3. You can see that if the animals had had E. coli four days earlier, that the learning task does not induce as much BDNF. But look at the runners. That effect is gone. BDNF is induced by the learning experience. So the opportunity to exercise, even though the level of exercise engaged in was quite minimal, was enough to reverse the effects of aging at all of the levels studied. Vulnerability of long-term memory formation to disruption by infection, microglial sensitization, potentiated hippocampal I1 production, and reduced BDNF. As I've talked to a lot of people today, and you can ask me about it later, I don't have time right now, we're also working on pharmacological drug means um, of interfering in this cascade. And we're actually quite hopeful uh, that we know what we're doing. OK, now I have not discussed two issues. And I won't, since there's no time. I'm just going to throw them out for you. And you can ask me later if you want. So I have not told you what I think about what exactly is sensitized with regard to microglial function. Which receptors, which signaling pathways, I've left that alone because of time. And I also haven't talked about what with age actually leads to these receptor signaling pathways, et cetera, changes. It isn't time. The brain doesn't really know about the passage of time. It has to be something that occurs with the passage with aging. And the question is, well, what is it? And is it reactive oxygen species? Is it this? Is it that? Whatever. And we have some ideas about that. I also can't talk about that. But I just want to point out to you that you can ask me about those things. But I do want to make three, to touch on three things before I summarize. So one thing I want to say is although this talk has focused on memory, other processes that are influenced by glia and glial products should be exaggerated by aging. And there's two things that a lot of people study that are a product of brain cytokines and glial activation. These have variously been called sickness behaviors, but also depression. Um, and I will make a long story short, because these should also then be exaggerated by aging, by the microglial priming. And I will make a long story short by saying, yes, they are. And the work of our lab and other labs uh, have, have actually looked at sickness behavior in aging animals after peripheral immune thing, depressive-like behaviors, et cetera, and they are exaggerated by aging. Two, things other than peripheral inflammatory events that activate glia should also have exaggerated effects in the aging. Right, I've talked about you know, surgery and infection, but anything else that activates glia, if these glia are sensitized by aging, should also, those effects should also be exaggerated by aging. 
And one of the things we've spent a lot of time studying in my lab, and I don't have time to talk about here, is that stress activates microglia. They do, it does, and we could talk about that again later. And so the effects of stress ought to also be exaggerated by aging, and they are. And finally, things other than aging that prime glia in a prolonged fashion should have similar consequences. And there's where I think the implications are for autism, if there are any. Um, and I've highlighted early life infection. So let me summarize what I've tried to tell you today. So I've said that inflammatory events in the periphery, outside the brain, signal the central nervous system. Um, and that this communication process initiates a cascade of changes in the CNS. And glial cells, especially microglial cells, are really at the heart of these changes. Uh, now, probably a lot of this is adaptive. That's why it's there. Microglia are constantly vigilant. They're sending out processes. And aging makes them more vigilant. There may be beneficial aspects to this exaggerated release of pro-inflammatory mediators, but here we've identified a cost. And I, I tend to think most mechanisms have a, an adaptive value and a cost, and you have to keep both of those in mind. So what I think is that there are periods of vulnerability in the aging. When you go in for hip surgery, if you get cancer chemotherapy, if you have a serious flu, if you have a heart attack, these are periods of vulnerability, and I think that's when you want to intervene. Um, and we're working very hard to develop agents that will do that. It's also recently reported that depression is actually a potent risk factor for the development of cognitive decline in aging. And depression interacts with these very same cytokine systems we're talking about and glial priming. And so I think that this whole idea of glial priming may have implications uh, that extend far beyond the bounds of aging uh, to some of the things that you all uh, are interested in. <laughs> I always do this. You know, I want to take credit for everything. Um, so this is, would you believe, only part of the lab group. Um, and so a special thanks go to Matt Frank, who's done a lot of the microglial work, and Amy Hine. There I am. There's my cohort, Linda Watkins. Um, and special thanks for this particular uh, body of work go to um, Jerry Rudy. Uh, guess who this is? And why I might have developed an interest in aging. <laughs> um, Jerry Rudy, who's collaborated with me on a lot of the learning memory work. He's really a memory expert and helped me with all these tasks and Mars water mazes and all the various tasks we've looked at. Oh, boy. I almost hate looking at that. Um, and Susan Patterson, who, who I collaborate with on all the LTP work. I don't do LTP. Ruth Barrientos, who's the postdoc in the lab, who's really primarily responsible for uh, spearheading uh, this task. And then my cohort in all things, Linda Watkins. Um, this is about 20 feet from our cabin, um, and who I collaborate with on everything. And so I always thank her. And so thank you for your attention. Were there any studies that use diet as a variable? So not in my lab, but surely in other labs. So there are a variety of labs looking at the effects of diet in this paradigm and related paradigms. Rodney Johnson at the University of Illinois is doing diet work. Uh, he, he, he comes to mind immediately. Uh, there's a group in Florida that is doing diet work. So, so yes, people are thinking just like you are, that, that dietary manipulations would be very interesting here. Um, I have not done any, any of those things personally, but yes, that's an active topic of, of investigation using this kind of paradigm. So um, I was wondering, you said that running inhibit the, um, the loss of um, cognition in the in elderly. So I was wondering, do you check other kind of exercise? Because um, there is this newspapers around that so that all running is the only one that, for example, stimulate neurogenesis yeah. in the hippocampus, but not other kind of exercise. Yeah. And then, what you mean by voluntary? Did you check involuntary movements? Have somebody so involuntary? So no, no, we okay. 
No. So. 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 Um, thank you. So voluntary running is the only exercise we have looked at in our lab. We have not looked at any other kind of exercise. That doesn't mean other kinds would not work, and we have never made them run. Um, I suspect from things that I know that if you make them run, you will not see these effects. That in point effect has to be voluntary. Um, and, I, and I suspect that because forced running is extremely stressful what for rats. Whatever you go to the, when you think that will happen, you go to the gym and you don't feel, feel like being there, but you're only lifting yourself. But it's voluntary. This is voluntary? Absolutely. <laughs> so, in, so, so the way people force rats to run is, is, is if they stop running and they get shocked or they fall off the thing. Very aversive things happen. And that's, that's a very different circumstance. Um, and so, yeah, if you force yourself, it's still voluntary. Nobody is prodding you with a, you know, a shock grid. Or, um, um, and people do, of course, in the human literature, study this extensively. They study, does it have to be aerobic? Can it be? You know, uh, resistance, and you know, there's a whole literature on this. And they're looking at hippocampal-based tasks. There's, you know, the Illinois group, uh, Kramer, that does all that. So there's there's an extensive human literature comparing different kinds of exercise. But it's actually not easy to do in an animal to to make it. Yeah, I, I don't know how you make them lift weights, and <laughs> you know, um, you know, put them on a bicycle or a trail. I mean, you know, it's like. You know, it's not, 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 not real obvious, but those are good questions. Uh, the question is, the response to stress you showed at the end, is that blocked by the IL-1 receptor antagonist also? Some are. And the second one is, I'm actually... Not all. You're not going to block all effects of stress with the IL-1 receptor antagonist. Okay. But yes, some of these you will. Okay. Second thing is, I'm actually a retired critical care physician, mm -hmm. and I wished I was a neuroscientist, so I come to all the basic science conferences. And I'm fascinated by, in the last 10 years in critical care, we've gotten really interested in ICU psychosis and its effect with cognitive decline. Indeed. And the things that you were saying Indeed. just fit so perfectly. I'm sure it must be a microbial so, mechanism. So I'm working with the, quickly, go ahead. And, and secondly, when you said exercise, one of the things that we have found is prophylaxis against developing that is exercise yes. patients. So we're getting patients on ventilators, right. out of bed, sitting right. them in a chair, moving them. And the other thing that we found to be tremendously is the pharmacologic thing, is the amount of sedations, benzodiazepines, right. and uh, analgesics that right. have a big effect. Right. So I wonder what the pharmacologic Yeah, so we're, we're actually too. working with some critical care people in Denver at the uh, VA, uh -huh. for people going in for surgery. And we're actually getting, we're actually getting a spinal uh, CSF that we can, uh, we can look for cytokines and all this kind of stuff. And, um, see what we can do. But what, that's exactly what we want to do, is, is, is develop something you can give to a person um, before they go in for their surgery that will prevent this post-operative delirium. I mean, in the human case, it's called delirium, typically, not. not and it clearly um, leads to. It, it, it predisposes you. It, 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 in fact, it's a strong. Delirium and decline. It's a, there's a strong. So if you, if you experience this post-operative delirium, it's a strong predisposing factor towards developing exactly. dementia later. Exactly. Absolutely. Of course, age is a major factor, not and, the only factor. Not the only, but yeah. ages. So I'm also working with a group that's looking at alcohol, where they think alcoholism is actually um, potentiates the post-operative cognitive decline, and whether that involves glia. Because um, most drugs of abuse strongly activate microglia. And it's certainly true of alcohol. <clears throat> so there are now a variety of research groups. We're one, but there are many others, essentially arguing that drugs of abuse are xenobiotics. They're foreign substances that enter the brain. They're not endogenous to the brain. They're foreign. And so naturally, cells in the brain that are immune cells will recognize them as foreign. And that there are actually receptors on microglia, the toll receptors, that actually actually recognize these drugs of abuse as foreign and the microglia become activated. So, and so we've shown this, other people have shown this, and so we're, we're busily trying to develop TLR antagonists, um, selective yeah, TLR antagonists. So, are endogenous cannabinoid receptors. Th th well, there are all kinds. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yes, but, but there are endogenous cannabinoid receptors, 
But the endogenous cannabinoid ligands are not chemically the same as the cannabinoid you ingest. And so it's the same thing with opioids. There are, of course, opiate receptors, and there are, of course, endogenous opioids. But morphine and heroin are structurally different. And they are actually recognized as foreign. So we just had a paper in Proceedings in National Academy showing that, that morphine is act, actually binds to and activates TLR4. And so it's recognized as foreign. And so, again, all these things can cross-pollinate because what the microglial cell is doing is summating all these. And so there the can be these multiple hits. Start thinking about vaccinations. Start thinking about, you know, there were all these multiple hits going on, no one of which by itself may do very much. Um, and so we're extremely interested in looking at things like that in terms of what happens when people go in for surgery um, and what can you do to, to intervene in that process. And, you know, exercise is great, but not everybody, you know, it's not going to work for everybody. Do seizures activate microglia is my question. Yes, massively. Okay. Now, and the mechanism there is even known. Remember the alarmins I talked about yeah. with you? Those yeah. are released by seizures. Okay. There's, there's several Italian groups that have shown that. Okay, that's, ve that's very interesting. So with all this activated microglia, um, I, I just want to know, I mean, do the neurons get killed off? Pro no. I mean, does the hippocampus shrink more? Because we know that hippocampus does shrink with I don't think stress this is, and depression. I don't know that this is the mechanism that produces that. So I, I, You don't think this could lead to neuronal cell death? No, it certainly could. The question is, to what extent? That's why I'm, you know, we've tried to look at various apoptotic markers and, you know, do tunnel staining. And we, we can see effects, but they're not. They don't make you want to jump up and down, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I like effects you can drive a truck through. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I have the, the, tr the truck image in the lab. You know, I want a line here and a line there, you can drive a truck through them. Mm -hmm. And that's not true of the. Mm -hmm. Does it lead to more like glutamate toxicity? Yes, it could easily. And then So yeah. one of the things that IL-1 does is it interferes with the GLT-1 glutamate transporter on astrocytes, which we didn't talk about, okay. and I didn't talk about here, because it just was a little off topic. But so, so there is a known mechanism by which once you get IL-1 going, it can actually increase synaptic levels of glutamate. Okay. okay. I don't so study, I don't study it because I don't have a glutamate assay in the So lab. once you really screw around with the astrocytes, then you're eventually affecting the neuron. Right, right, right. So I would actually study this if I had a good glutamate assay and I haven't, it's too painful for me to, so I do a lot of microdialysis, but glutamate's really not good that way. You really want to do voltometry and I don't want to learn voltometry. And you know, it's one of those things. Um, in a couple of slides, you had some other inflammatory cytokines listed. Oh, yeah. How specific is this to IL-1 beta? It's not. Okay. But I think IL-1 is key because it sort of potentiates a lot of these. So mm -hmm. you can see things sometimes with TNF, IL-6. You can always see the end of kappa B. So that's one of the things we usually measure because that's downstream. Um, the effects are often most prominent with IL-1 beta, hmm. but you often see with you know, things like MCP1, which I talked to somebody about today, is often massively changes. Mm -hmm. You know, we often look at 14, 16 proteins and trying to put them all on one set of graphs. Yeah. So, so but, 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 but I think IL-1 is really critical. Critical yes. to it. So the question then is, what about, you know, like even something as simple as over-the-counter anti-inflammatories? They're not effective enough. Really? So I think, I think a lot of the anti-inflammatory drug trials wind up throwing the baby out with the bathwater because you give somebody ibuprofen, what? You know, they're prostaglandin inhibitors, but that's just one little part of inflammation, and it's not enough. 
And so I think often the anti-inflammatories don't work, but it's not because the idea is wrong. It's not because inflammation is unimportant, it's because they're just plain not that effective against inflammation. Because they're only going after this one little Cox pathway, or and it doesn't do anything about all the rest of it. And that's why I think you have to go at things that are upstream from that, that really set off multiple, once the entire cascade is set off and you've got reactive oxygen species going and INOS and, you know, going after one part, that's why I'm always, so I was very excited today to talk to somebody, who, or apparently somebody here has developed a really selective uh, microglial inhibitor. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think you, you want to go at that, you want to inhibit things at the level of microglia or receptors on the microglia or um, someplace like that. And I prefer not mucking in the peripheral immune system, so I don't want to block things peripherally because, you know, you need all that stuff for fighting infection. And um, anyway, that's my bias. So we're trying to develop TLR antagonists. That's, and we, we have a really selective TLR4 antagonist. TLR2 is a problem so far. Um, we have something that will block both TLR2 and 4, but it's not selective. And I'm learning more chemistry than I ever wanted to know. So I'm still thinking in movement. So in my lab, we have a model of a spinal cord injury, and we are developing a new treatment that is based on the secretion of BDNF uh -huh. uh, by human st uh, stem cells that we transplant after the injury. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, why, what will happen if you take the legs of, in this case, the animal, and move it? I don't know. Will you increase secretion of BDNF? Because perhaps yeah. we are doing all I don't know. setting up all this paraphernalia to increase BDNF, and we just need to move the legs. You is think? this considered voluntary? Or? I no, no, that's not, that's not voluntary, no. This is not, not voluntary. Not. They cannot move the legs. Yeah, I, yeah so that's, that's intriguing. No. It, so you think, just think it's the actual movement? Yes, I, I don't know if, if you move I the don't legs. Know. We will increase the secretion. We should talk. <laughs> <laughs> The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.